analysis of production staff in May of 2003, 10 years ago. He's a career officer in the CIA since 1986 and has held a number of very senior posts, one as special assistant to the UN ambassador, Richard Holbrook, during the late Putin administration, also during the Bush administration as Deputy National Security Advisor to <coughs> Secretary of the Treasury, Paul O'Neill. He's been an analyst in the CIA's Office of European Analysis. He worked at the U.S. Mission uh, at the EU in Brussels uh, in the mid 90s. Uh, he has a distinguished background academically, got his PhD from Cambridge University, and um, has written widely on uh, for British and French academic journals, and he has his undergraduate degree from Western University. But his big claim to fame, big claim to fame is that he has done, um, the person who put together the NICS, uh, the, um, the NIC is the National Government, uh, does national intelligence estimates. These are not secret documents, they are public documents. And in the case of the last uh, one in particular, apparently it was the number one bestseller for Amazon's Kindle's International Relations uh, series. And number two in the uh, US politics category. So it's unusual that a US government document ever become a best-selling <laughs> electronic or otherwise. So, scary. <laughs> it's actually scary. It's actually scary. So uh, uh, we, those of us who worked in the federal government, uh, uh, Brian, myself, uh, Larry, know how important the NIC is and how these, uh, these assessments influence policy and policymakers, and they influence the Hill and appropriation levels and the news media. So. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have uh, and, and to have uh, Dr. Burroughs here today. He is a friend of Gabriella and Chris, uh, who invited him to come with, with, with us. Uh, so we're, we're, we're very pleased you've joined us today. Thank you. The pleasure is on my side. I really enjoy coming down here. Uh, and I actually, on the global trends work, um, we started, I think, back in 2008. We had a meeting here after we published the Global Trends 2025. Um, and then since I've kept up, I've been down here a number of times, and we had for the last one um, really a role playing, working um, scenario where we brought in both outside experts, but also use the Bush School really to hammer out some very interesting scenario about the, the role of the U.S. in the world. Uh, and also the dollar, the, the future of the dollar, something I'm sure the Treasury Department <laughs> does want, doesn't want to speculate about. Um, I want to talk to you um, here about um, actually my experiences in, in doing uh, global trends, but more importantly to the, um, the, the substantive um, lessons uh, that I've learned in something which I think is very important actually for the future of the U.S. And I've distilled down um, what I call the, the lessons from these global trends in the, in the five, but I five key challenges for us. So I wanted to talk about that in a little bit um, at the end also about where I see the university academia fitting into this. Because I also think, as Andrew just said, I have an academic background, so I also see actually the, the real critical role that the Bush School, other schools, like the Bush School, and, and academia, broadly speaking, really, uh, should be playing in this it is really an intensely interesting era. I have to say, uh, you know, I, with uh, policymakers, um, who I think briefing this on global trends are, you know, wringing their hands because I mean, a lot of the messages you're giving are not necessarily the ones that they, they hear. Um, but for analysts, and I've been an analyst most of my career. I mean, this is the best period. Uh, to be alive. 
because you are seeing all these transformations uh, and transformations happening at the same time. So, as I said, five key forces which I see are shaping, uh, reshaping the world, and each of which uh, really constitute a skill challenge to our way of life. A few historic precedents exist for the number of transformations happening simultaneously. Um, and it's my contention, based on the experience of doing the last three NIC Global Trends work, that we are unprepared and even a little gun shy about delving deeply for fear that the challenges that this brave new world presents politically, socially, and economically are going to be pretty stiff. 9-11 and the 2008 financial crisis <coughs> caused us as a nation to want to bury our head in the sand. Moreover, because both of those events were shocks and properly seen as completely unanticipated and unpredictable, there's aversion to any sort of planning, least of all from the government. Uh, because no one has a crystal ball, there is reason, or some would see it this way, in um, not even trying to plan for a totally new future. More on this later, uh, but let's defy the critics and delve into what signals exist out there for, for a new future. And as I said, what signals they are, I mean, it's really, as an analyst, this is, it, this is a really intriguing, challenging, obviously, but exciting period, actually, to think about. So multiple transformations ongoing. The first of them is the middle class rise in the emerging world. Second would be the dramatic shift in economic and, and political might, east to west, west to east and south. A reshaping of the nature of power is my Third, an accelerating technology revolution. Four, and the fifth is a rapidly accumulating set of risks that are very hard to assess. So the first key uh, force reshaping the world is the extraordinary phenomenon of the middle class uh, rise in the emerging world. We have not yet lived in a world where the poor weren't the largest single block. The kind found in the grim slums of Mumbai, the ghettos of Nairobi. As wrenching as these places are, they're not the predominant trend taking hold. New technology, lower labor costs that draw manufacturers away from the West, and the more pro-business attitude by many governments have kick-started a giant middle class all around the world. They're acquiring homes, cars, a better life for their children. In places like Rio's favelas, the famous slum dwellers, once dispossessed and marginalized <coughs> by becoming property owners. Instead of squatters, many are commuting to work, something akin to suburbanites in American city. This new middle class leads still very modest lives, not on the level of what we necessarily would see as middle middle class, much more lower middle class. But in the case of, of some of these Rio favelas, the drug and gay culture is actually uh, receding a bit, and that's very good. For all the benefits, there are also unanticipated consequences of a ballooning middle class. In Britain, for example, MI5 is finding that the accumulating biographies of terrorists often reveal their struggles as aspiring middle class immigrants trying to fit into a different culture. In China, a Beijing University pr professor talked to me once about the startling amount of cheating, bribery, blackmail taking place at even the most prestigious universities. <coughs> Students, or more often their parents, want better grades and a better chance of attaining or staying in the middle class. The professor himself has been physically, said he was physically threatened, telling me that uh, it was the families of government officials who tried hardest to bend the system to their child's advantage. Being middle class brings new anxieties and new insecurities, not the complacency 
and contentment with the status quo foretold, <coughs> uh, foretold by Huntington. Increasingly, Chinese studies see a discontent in the middle class despite the fundamental progress in the growth of the middle class. In 2000, a mere 4% of urban Chinese households were considered middle class. By 2012, that figure has grown to 66%, on the way to a probable 75% in 2022. That, that translates into nearly 6 130 million customers, consumers, nearly twice the entire population of the U.S. Brazil is a similar case, both in the explosion of the middle class and growing dissatisfaction and worries about the future for their children. The recent demonstrations there might be the tip of a more global middle class phenomenon the protests and worries about growing inequality. Now, the irony of this is that it's occurring when in the U.S., Europe, and some other developed places, there's the opposite worry of a declining middle class. And indeed, the recent news about the long-term plateauing of medium household income <coughs> in the U.S. is very discouraging. I think here we have shared anxieties, both those supposedly on the rise in the middle class and those, like in the U.S., struggling to hold on to their position. And the, and the nature of the global economy and emerging technologies, I think, is going to make this, this struggle, at least in the medium term, even more difficult, both for those already in the middle class, trying to stick to it, and those aspiring to be part of it. Okay, the second transformation, as I said, we're looking at the end of four to five centuries of Western hegemony. Um, since 2008 financial crisis, we can no longer ignore the economic muscle of Asia and other developing states. And the new imprint they're putting on the world, China's investment power in the U.S. has grown exponentially in the past five years, while the strength <coughs> of U.S. investors is fading. A branch of the iconic Roosevelt family, for example, wanted to embark on an unconventional drilling project for shale oil. They have extensive properties here in Texas, but their dream was only realized with the help of Chinese money. No U investors, U.S. investors would step up. McKenzie provided us, when we were doing the Global Trends Report, with a graphic that is, that is really mind-blowing. It's on page 47. You want to see it? It shows that over a year, six years, looking out to 2020, um, the emerging market share of global financial assets will double. Um, that is, a lot of it is a result of much higher savings rate in China, other places in the developing world, and a higher growth rate, and a larger, rapidly expanding economy. A decade ago, only a few could comprehend the notion of a receding U.S. When Condoleezza Rice was briefed on an earlier version of the Global Trends Report on her way to becoming Secretary of State, she thought it was nuts to suggest that the West could bow to a rise in peace. Now, most economists acknowledge that the global economy would have collapsed four years ago had China not stepped in with a large stimulus package. But Rice may have a point, too. The West can't dominate the way it used to, but many of its values may continue to force through <coughs> other cultures. It won't, though, be the U.S.-led world the way it was. And those values, some values will be retained, others probably not. And we can discuss that more. If your friend, best friend's son was a paraplegic and you had the means to help, we know this is one of uh, this is how one of the biggest robot developers in Silicon Valley got his inspiration. The friend's child was entering adulthood without being able to care for himself. An institution loomed in his near future. Now a human-like robot stays at his side, allowing him to live a semi-normal life with the aid of his android friend. The young man can manage more or less on his own. 
the new scientific and technological advances also pose dilemmas. We're on the verge of a major recalibration of the relationship between man and machine, the result of work that has been incubating in labs for decades and is now starting to emerge. Foxcam, maker of Apple products in Asia, has plans to eliminate 80% of its workforce through introduction of robotic devices. Economists worry about the ability of workers and professionals to adapt and up their skills in this fast-paced technological juggernaut. Economists now are talking about long-term structural uh, unemployment and an underclass of dropouts, many of which never got on the employer uh, conveyor belt in the first place. Big data combined with an increasingly ubiquitous sensors Sensors mean humans can be taken out of the day-to-day -day regulation of big systems like electrical grids. Quantum computers will make automation of big systems even more practical. Who regulates these advancements? Without borders and boundaries, new technologies could create their own problems. We've seen some of the discussion already on Edward Snowden's revelation and the rising concerns about privacy protection. But this, I think, is, is just the tip of the iceberg. For all of this, it's getting harder to stay at the top of our game. The nature of power is fundamentally changing, and this is the fourth major change. And it's more than just about how much government should, how much uh, power government should have. Recent studies have shown that corporations are unable to maintain a perch in the top tier of their industry with the ease that they once could. Today, CEOs and political leaders have a shorter shelf life than their predecessors, and the lifespan of a corporation on the S&P 500 continues to drop. Power is going downstream to those who never had it. Traditional government supremacy is also being squeezed. As we've said, nations in the East are claiming it from the West, International corporations are fighting above their weight, as are many non-governmental organizations and terrorist groups and other criminal networks. Enabled by communication technology, power is shifting towards complex and amorphous networks. The individual, him or herself, has more power. The Global Trends 2030 work started with this concept of individual empowerment, citing it as the most important mega trend because it's both cause and effect of most of the other uh, trends, including expanding global economies, rapid growth of the developing countries, and widespread exploitation of new communications um, technologies. The centrifugal force of this power shift, however, will make it more difficult to meet the mounting challenges. It's hard to put together the needed coalitions to deal with the growing global challenges because many more active, not just states, have to come together. Moreover, discordant values among many players will make it harder uh, for multilateral institutions to operate. In, to my mind, authoritarian states are the least prepared to wield this, their new muscle. And those countries whose grip on power is diminishing will face a challenge to their democratic way of governance, the U.S. included. Every one of these challenges is speeding towards us, all at once. Soon one trend will be backing on another, magnifying the effects of each. The growing global middle class, with its increasing appetite for meat and high protein, puts enormous strain on critical necessities such as food and water, just as climate change is aggravating our ability to provide these economies, these commodities. Then balance that against some positives, like cheaper energy supplies that will help with food production and water desalination. And yet, if the cheap energy slows the transition away from fossil fuels, it will worsen climate change. Trying to figure out the risks associated with depleting water or food supplies in the context of a changing climate, which we don't fully understand, is only one example of the challenges facing risk analysis. 
statistics and modeling can get you only so far. I think having some imagination about how events or developments can build on one another is a real must. I've been struck by the outpouring of interest <coughs> in the last edition of Global Trends um, among a widely dispersed set of communities. You know, there's the government officials, obviously, but increasingly I get invitations from hedge fund managers trying to understand medium term, HR executives in major industries trying to understand the changing workforce and how these trends are actually going to, going to impact um, from technology or from um, also the changing, the growth of the middle class in some countries. Um, there's huge, I think, thinking beyond the inbox has, has become even more important because of the growing likelihood of shocks particularly coming latter. People understand <coughs> their own realm where the shocks can be, but when they actually are, are coming at you from totally different domains, that's where it's uh, most difficult. And increasingly, that's where a lot of shocks are likely to be. These five trends, in many instances, is point to a positive future. I've actually been accused by some of writing Whiggish history. Um, I only hope that it turns out that way. I have pretty much confidence in the long, long run that we're, we're looking at actually a very much better world. Um, but in the shorter or medium term, there's where I see problems. And there are a number of, of what I would call what, what ifs they could change the trajectory of these trends and make them more challenging, if not insidious and dangerous. What if major war hits, or mass revolution, or economic collapse? How could any of these changes impact what's in store? Human nature compels us to think about the future as a linear projection of the present, but of course we know that that doesn't happen. From China and India and Asia to Pakistan, Egypt and the Middle East to Nigeria and West Africa, governments are sitting on simmering volcanoes of popular discontent. Some Chinese officials interviewed for the global trends work admit that their country needs political reform, but doesn't know how to move toward that. Nigerians talk about the likelihood of their, or the possibility of their country splintering in the conflict between Christians and Muslims. The new middle class across many continents is also rising with a loud voice, making demands they once could never fathom uh, to have done. We talk in the Global Trends 2030 about 50 or so countries traversing the very unstable ground of, of democratization. <clears throat> this is a huge number. And at the same time, we know democracy democratization, very unstable process. We should all recall that most revolutionary leaders from Danton, Robespierre, to Lenin, Trotsky, Bolshevik, Russia, were frustrated members of the middle class. Growing prosperity has a powerful record as a spark for revolution. A revolt in China or India or nuclear <coughs> Pakistan could have cascading effects across the the late 19th and early 20th century of Belle Epoque uh, was a period of shimmering calm before turbulence. Two of the biggest wars the, the world has seen are about to, to shatter lives across the continent. Vast alliances between major powers were the order of the day. War will be different in our future. It is unlikely to be fought only between states, but involve private armies like Hezbollah or Pakistani militants and some will have laid their hands on nuclear weapons. Some instruments of war will be new and horrific in the wrong hands. Entire communities of bio hobbyists are experimenting with genetics and disease that could lead to the discovery of deadly viruses. It's a work that can be done in garages. The scale needed in terms of equipment is modest, and most have some academic training. Rarely are these people terrorists, but excited by the prospect of scientific discovery, they could make a grave error or find their work in the wrong hands. We 
we haven't got to the stage yet, but one could conceive of cyber attacks disrupting civilian infrastructures like transportation systems or airports or subways. <coughs> No physical attack, no trace of the Meanwhile, government agents are, are focused, to, are now focused on the increasing overlap between highly dangerous criminal and human smuggling networks, the type we see in Mexico, Central America, or West Africa, and terrorist groups like the Lebanese Hezbollah. The right alliance between these groups aimed at the right target, using the right weapon, opens possibilities beyond imagination a few years ago. The puncturing of US unipolar supremacy is a structural theme in the work, in the global trends work, going back to 2020, the first one we did in 2004. But even our ad adversaries worry about the state of international law without the might of the US keeping order. Many Chinese government officials and businessmen believe a conflict with the U.S. is inevitable, but worry about who will manage volatile regions of the world like the Middle East if the voice of the U.S. grows more faint. Chinese officials are very fond of telling you that the Middle East is the graveyard of past empires, and they have suggested some in a rather sly tone that the U.S. would have a better slot, shot at overcoming the odds in a newly emerging China. Gulf Arabs, Israelis already see a declining presence from the U.S. and worry that if the U.S. grows more energy independent, as they believe it, it probably will, it will encourage a further U.S. withdrawal from the Middle East. America's ability to brandish power surely weakens, but many fear that the vacuum left behind could bring great problems of its own. Do I think any of these things, such as revolution or war, will actually happen? I'm not of the school that sees a no or a No doubt it's the centenary of the opening salvos of the Great War of 1914 and 1918 comes upon us. There will be plenty who draw the many parallels, and there are a lot of parallels. I can easily conceive and worry about bilateral contacts, contests but not with a large-scale propagation. However, a bilateral um, conflict between India or Pakistan could have serious ramifications on its own, reintroducing us uh, to a nuclear war. A Sino-US conflict would be the most serious and the most likely to, to lead to a larger scale uh, full world war. As mentioned, there are disturbing signs on both sides of distrust. However, too much is at stake. Unlike during the Cold War, China and the US are so economically interdependent, and both sides know that. More likely and maybe more worrisome would be a drift back to balance a power politics in the international arena away from the multilateralism or the development of a liberal order that marked the U.S. run. Historically, the world is much more experienced with multipolarity without multilateralism. In such a world, it would be much harder to deal with all the global challenges I've mentioned as future trends. And in the longer run, because of the long-term challenges are global, such as climate change, proliferation, water, food, and cyber, the lack of strong multilateral institutions and global governance could mean these problems would not be covered. <clears throat> Finally, let me end on a note, as I mentioned earlier, about the role, the really essential role for academia in helping us map out future tra uh, trajectories. Much of what I've, I have described is unprecedented, but a lot is deja vu. For example, the rise of the middle class, History may not repeat, but it rhymes, as Mark Twain would say, in an understanding about how events unfolded in the past can help us decipher trajectories in the future. Academe can provide a service in helping us think about possible scenarios. I show a bias here in thinking history is going to be especially important. Taking the one example of the middle class rise, we know a lot of economics <coughs> to expand where it's happening, how the middle class is is broken down, what sectors 
um, and what their specific buying habits are. However, we don't know what it means. <coughs> Will the middle class rise in the emerging world be as tragic as it was in many countries in 19th and 20th century Europe, laying the groundwork for explosive nationalisms and increasing class co conflict? How does universal connectivity and the emergence of other technologies change the nature of, of the middle class world? Conventional tools we have, public opinion surveys, don't really give us a window into those factors, particularly how they could combine with others. And this is really the, the role for, for actually academics begin to, to pull these past lessons much more out, put them in the public consciousness, and stimulate thinking about how future could, could work out, hopefully with the idea that we can steer much more towards the positive future. That, I see, is your challenge, uh, and challenge certainly in, in training the next generation of, of leaders. So I'll end on that positive note. Thank you for your attention. And Stunned into silence. Somebody must <laughs> want to ask a question. Chris? Chris well, I'll yeah. ask a Chris question. Um, as you explain it, one possibility is that the need for global governance, the need for multilateral organizations to solve this long laundry list of problems will somehow transform international politics. Um, but I want to ask, I mean, don't you give any credence to the idea that global great power politics is just a very stubborn part of the international system? It's not likely to go away. I, 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 I think, you know, there, as I said at the, at the end, I mean, there's a real possibility of balance of power politics, which was the old great power politics. And people see very sh their interest in short term and in very, I say, uh, restricted uh, views and thinking that, um, you know, they don't, for whatever reason, they don't need to worry about these broader um, global issues, um, that that presents a, a threat. And I think, you know, you have a couple of, of trends here weaving in and out, and I'd say one of the most serious, <laughs> and one of the most, and one of the most important um, I, uh, problems, I think, is on the economic side, where you find that everybody, for their own reason, and maybe for a very good reason, is going to be turning inward and trying to, you know, solve their own issues. So if it's you know, the West, you're consumed with how do you um, keep your middle class, how do you, um, you know, find employment for your youth, how do you deal with this fast-paced technological revolution, which um, is eliminating more workers and it's, it's actually um, <coughs> putting, into the, uh, putting into the economy. Um, and so in that sort of scenario, I think the, the shorter term interests and, you know, the, the non-interest in some cases in the, in the more international scene is going to predominate. And, and I think you can see this too. We had a discussion earlier about, you know, in the developing world, yes, as I've outlined, I mean, they are going to be the, the largest economy, but you have this paradox that, you know, <coughs> Per capita sense, a lot of the people in the China or India are going to feel they're still very much poorer than ones in, in um, the Western uh, states. Even though you know those middle classes also feel very beleaguered. So, you know, we had an interesting um, uh, 
meeting with some Chinese officials, this was back in, I think, 2009 or 2010, um, and we were looking at this issue of global governance, and, and so one key official, uh, actually it's Wang Jizhou, who heads the Peking University School, training a future Chinese uh, officials got very angry about, you know, how can you expect China, is it still a poor country, how can you expect them, uh, China actually to shoulder these, these increasing concerns if it's climate change or if it's um, some of the proliferation issues or if it's the Middle East, whatever. Um, you know, and I think, I think that's going to be a, a huge problem. It's going to be very difficult, you know, really to, to establish any sort of either formal or informal government, global government system. The tendency will be much more switched to, the, to a chaotic or a more anarchical system. Yes. Uh, Matt, I want to ask you a question, and you alluded at, and I think it's right now uh, a big question in the study of international relations. So you use the term world order and the liberal order, international order that the United States of America created in the process. And the question is, if the United States of America will not be able to maintain the order as a hegemon, then we will see, and we already see all sorts of institutions on the rise. <coughs> you said, well, part of American values will be preserved by this institution, part not. So there are two theses there, one that say, oh, our values will be preserved. It's after hegemony. We're going to leave further because of our liberal international order. The other school says, oh, no, you get these new actors into these institutions. They will impose their own values and their own view of the world. So, I would like to know where you stand on this issue. Well, I, I, um, I kind of stand in between those two schools. <laughs> I, I mean, on the one hand, you know, I, I think values that, such as even individualism, because I think that is associated with a lot of middle class rise. Mm -hmm. and, um, so individualism, certainly um, capitalism, I mean, you're different varieties of that, I mean, you're going to find some countries much more um, wanting state capitalism versus a more um, liberal um, capitalism. So, you know, it is not, we're not talking about here a world of, you know, capitalism or communism the way we did, uh, which is very, I think, diverse set of, of that. Um, on the other hand, you know, and this gets back maybe to Chris's issue, I think uh, we may be losing on the um, issues like responsibility to protect. Um, you know, that um, the, 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 the new states may, and the emerging states may be more Westphalian than we are. Um, and, um, you know, you see some of the, the, the this and the, the recent Syria um, uh, debate, obviously, um, and certainly in the backlash uh, after Libya. I mean, feeling that you know, U.S. European partners overstepped their bounds there and took liberties with what was in the red resolution, um, and you know, dovetailing a little bit with what I said economically, you don't have this. Um, I'd say, feeling that you did after the end of the Second World War, um, that you need to create you know, these, these global institutions to, um, to really make sure that you don't have war in the future. That was a dream in Europe. Um, we've seen, you know, I don't, and maybe Europe is a good example, is I don't see the EU going away in any sense. But certainly you do see the rise of nationalism. <laughs> so one of the overriding themes of your talk is, is that for a variety of political, economic, and technological reasons, the individual or the group 
is being empowered vis-a-vis -vis the state. And the state's authority and its power over its citizenry, over groups within, the, within its borders, is waning. Yet, let me, let me push back on that a little bit. It seems to me that all the uh, factors you identify, the rise of information technologies, economic growth, actually empowers the state vis-a-vis -vis the individual, vis-a-vis -vis the group, gives it resources, <coughs> with a monitoring of its citizenry. And we've had proclamations of the death of the state before, going back, you know, 150, 200 years. So I'd like to, you know, push back a little bit and say, why do you think the state is so irrelevant to this country? Or why do you think the state is weakening? And why is the individual being empowered? And what does a change of that assessment do to the nature of world politics? Well, first, you know, I'm not saying that the state is going to No, I understand. I, mean, I, I think what you, you should think about this in a way that you have many more actors now, and the individual in that sense uh, being more potent actor than, than, than previous. Um, I think, you know, a lot of it is on, on technology which have favored much more uh, individuals. Now you have, and this is the, you know, alluded to it here with the Snowden stuff, which is very interesting, is, you know, with big data, you, you do have potential uh, on the part of government to, to have much more control knowing what your citizens are doing in every point and, and theoretically anyways are able to intervene. Um, my sense is though that, you know, from the debates and others that they're going to, at least in, in many countries, you're, you're actually going to be uh, putting safeguards against those, those powers of government. Some privacy, some restrictions on, on how much, you know, Buying can be done. Um, that, that's not in Western all, countries, though. What, I'm sorry, that's in like liberal working countries, right? If you're an autocracy, it's just the opposite. Well, I, I mean, you know, I think still, if you look like in, in China, you know, and you look over the past uh, decade or two, the rise of the longest year, um, the ability of a lot of Chinese um, to actually circumvent. Uh, even though you know the state is pulling in huge uh, resources in order to, to track, to to censor, to, to restrict, um, and they've had to bow to some of that. I mean, they they can't do the things that they did um, during the SARS uh, crisis, trying to restrict um, information because the doctors now you know went outside the system and. and you know, this is part of the greater interdependence between countries. Uh, is that even your country, own country, is restricted? I mean, there are groups outside that you can appeal to, that you can go to uh, to actually um, get your message out to, to try to you know, change, have an impact uh, on your own government. In my own mind, I think the balance has shifted. Um, you know, the interesting thing again would be to look historically on this um, with technological revolutions. You could look back to the um, Gutenberg Bible, the invention of the printing press. So, in the first instance, um, basically the individual was, say, in, you know, dissident Protestant groups and so on were advantaged quite quite a lot, and the, the church during the counter-revolution actually learned how to use the printing press with the dissemination of all these tracts and so on that they sent their missionaries off with, and also in the debates within Europe, I mean, that they actually could use that in, uh, for their advantage, and I think you'll see, you know, a little bit of this wave action going on, but Overall, I think the individual still still got the upper hand. But it'd be interesting to sort of yeah. parallel to yeah. So, um, on the subject of Sino-American conflict, it seems that the big the big variable for peace that people tend to refer to is the fact that these economies are interconnected. But uh, last week, Professor Lane gave an excellent talk about how. Um, <laughs> uh, many of these problems actually mirror that of World War One, where we have a very interdependent Europe, 
and they still want to major power war, even though it ruined several of these countries. So I just kind of want to know what's changed. Why do you put faith in this variable? Um, I, I, you know, as I said, I, I think particularly with the centenary coming up, that you, you know, there's going to be a huge. Uh, so I would say economy is one, but probably as important is uh, a certain consciousness that um, you know war is not going to do either side any good, and that you know an understanding of what did happen with the first world war, second world war. Um, uh, means that you're not going to go down that path, even though you're going to have you know, we had a discussion in Washington on this last week. You now we retired from government, the Atlantic Council, and there is a vision group, you high-level U.S.-China vision group, which the Atlantic Council is bringing together. And one of the issues here is a worry that you know within part of governments on both sides, there are factions that, in some ways, are are interested in actually elevating the, the conflict as a possibility for budgetary reasons and other um, reasons. And, you know, you have, as I said, Chinese talk about this as being inevitable and Americans, um, but I don't, I, I think we learned some lessons. I, I make a parallel here with the financial crisis. Um, you know, 2008 financial crisis hit Everybody said, okay, we're going to get right into protection. I mean, this was a, you know, just like in 20s, 30s, um, people pulling up the drawbridge. It didn't happen. And what you did actually find, this is an instance where everybody's interest was more or less aligned, whether you were U.S., China, or any other country, you didn't want to see a, a, a depression again. Um, so, you know, there was maybe not as coordinated as could be, but there was some, some coordinated action. Uh, and I think a lot of that was due to the fact that people had studied the, the, what happened in the 20th century. Can, can I just make a quick interjection? For anybody who's really interested in this, there's a wonderful new book out by Charles Emerson yeah. called 1913. And, uh, I, I just would say you should take a look at it. For me, it reminds us that sometimes we we do think our historical era that we live in is unique. But the, there was never a time when people were more optimistic and more confident in trans, transnational movement, international organization, the fact that the great power war was over than just on the eve of one of the greatest cataclysms the world has ever known. So, sort of a cautionary book. No, and, and uh, you know, as I said, you know, knowing your history and going back to your history, I mean, very valuable. You, you, so you don't have to repeat. Uh, and you know, it is true. There's a huge number of parallels. I guess we're all obsessed by World War One because we just had a conference here. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Matt, what about the role of nuclear weapons? I mean, I would have expected uh, to have some reflection on the future of that. Because it used to be that people worried about the proliferation of these weapons of mass destruction and how that was going to. Do you, do you see that as receding in the problem set, or, or is it still right at the top of it? No, I, I think that's still right. There. Have to see what happens on, uh, but uh, I think here, even if, and I think we ran a scenario, and I don't know if it was part of what we did here, but mm -hmm. um, basically, you know, even if Iran stops short, but people have the um, know that it can develop in short order. Uh, a nuclear uh, device. I think that is potentially very stabilizing uh, other sort of uh, guarantees and commitments. And um, you know, I think that again, you want to look at a combination <coughs> of factors. I don't think it's just whether a country gets nuclear weapons or not, uh, but the combination of factors surrounding that. You know, you know. We, we've had two in the 
I, I'm not of the school that believes that, you know, the, the kind of stability that was um, induced by nuclear weapons uh, in this Cold War era, where it was a stabilizing factor, will necessarily happen. Like, you know, at least, I think probably, you know, I worry less about North Korea that itself could be so disruptive, but I think even more shared interest there about North, North, North Korea not, shouldn't have uh, a bomb. Now, you have some various scenarios where that could also get out of hand and you could engender some conflict. But I think the Middle East one is much more volatile. There's a trend in, uh, among some of the Asian countries to start leasing huge amounts of tracts of land in Africa, which is relatively thinly populated. And the Africans are now beginning to resist this. And, and the reason I bring it up is not about whether that's a good idea, but there's concern in India, in Japan, and South Korea, and particularly in China, that they're not going to be able to feed their populations in 50 years. Is food, food has caused wars before. There is some evidence that Japanese militarism in the 30s, we, we focus all the time on the oil supply issue. Yeah. And in fact, the ultimate issue was <coughs> the ability to feed one population. And their expansionism was driven by that. Now, you didn't talk about this at all because there's so many different trends. But do you see that as an issue that we should be concerned about? Yes. You know, we raised it. We got <laughs> three times for raising it. But we raised uh, the possibility of resources. And historically, it's like a Japanese case, but there are a lot of other cases. You know, resource scarcity didn't end up in kind of going to war with one another. But I do see you know, what I worry about, particularly, and this is, gets to this question on climate change, is that you can have very rapid disruptions to your ability to grow or in terms of water is a, is a, you know, the, one of the early reports coming out of the IPCC is about the glaciers um, drying up and water supply in South Asia um, being dramatically reduced. If this happens in a very rapid um, manner, then I think it's harder actually to avoid so I think in the crisis, it's going to be very difficult to get you know, countries together to share out if they're sharing a, a water supply. Um, you know, if you have pre-existing uh, agreements, then I think it, it may be, it would be probably more likely to avoid the crisis. But most of the agreements on water sharing for them completely out of date. <laughs> Uh, you know, in the Nile, an agreement that dates back to the British um, times, which didn't even seem to take into consideration Ethiopian um, you know, um, equities. And Ethiopia, of course, has this very high birth rate. At um, the same time, you have downstream, you also have countries that are desperate for that water. Um, you know, that's a crying out for some sort of effort to, to, to um, bring the, the agreement up to date, um, put in some measures, confidence building, and also look at, um, you know, connect that with some of the food issues. I mean, the one really troubling thing on the food, I would say more than in Asia, I know you're right to say that they are going out buying land to, as a hedge, but you know they've had a better record actually in food production. Um, the ones you know we worry about, particularly again in connection with climate change, is Africa, um, where you have the productivity has actually slightly gone down, and you have this burden in population. Um, and so you know, that this is a huge. A really huge issue, and, and again, you know, one of the, the theses in the, in the 
work is that you actually have more and more of these global challenges, challenges that you can. Maybe some of them you can resolve regionally, but in, in a lot of cases, too, that they're really global in scope. But you don't have actually the, um, or you're not likely to have a global order that may be interested in, in, in solving these or capable of solving And, and um, you know, that's the real conundrum, I would say, about you know, if you're looking forward in this some new international uh, world. Yeah. Do you have time for one more? Sure. Yeah. Um, picking up on your last point, um, and going back to the Middle East, I was wondering how you would relate these broad trends you described to what is going on on the ground uh, throughout the Middle East and the um, inability of outside actors um, uh, to even predict uh, what's happening next in Egypt, Syria, Tunisia, Libya, Iraq, uh, let alone influencing. Well, I think on the, you know, on your last point there, I'm not sure how you can predict that. I think you have so many different factors operating at the same time. I think this is, you know, a real opportunity for developing scenarios to really understand, you know, the different future that you could see for, for the region. And then I'm just trying to understand too some of the drivers. I think, you know, there is, and some people are writing about this, you know, middle class is obviously planning the in a lot of these societies, you can see that in India, you see it in Egypt, obviously, the communications. Um, you know, it's, it enables, empowers, you could say, the activists um, in the Arab Spring uh, revolutions and that. Um, but you could, you know, also. You know, what I was saying about democratization and that process, I mean, it's a very messy one, and it's going to be backsliding. And I think the populations themselves are trying to decide between do I want security, which, you know, given what is the turbulence, that's, I think your middle class is, is really going to, to move towards uh, the security side and sacrifice some of their liberties and individuals because they find the lack of security so um, threat. Um, and that, uh, but I think it's going to be, uh, you, you know, you're not going to be able to constitute a uh, historic um, type of regime that goes on for decades. I think what we need likely to see is more constant. Uh, the big issue there is on the economy and that uh, I think that would, should have been where we put a lot more effort after the Arab Spring revolution. You know, this is again looking back in history, I mean, how do revolutions go extreme? I mean, it's when the economic foundations really are pulled under. Um, you know, they are going to go a lot more extreme. And so this is a real, it's a critical issue, and I don't see anybody yet who really has a handle on that. It may have a better handle on how you get security, that be handed to police and the security forces, but how you get the economy going, you know, I don't see that. And there's a lot of economic data to say that things really slip in terms of education, building skills, even they were doing that before the revolution, even more so. Yes. Thank you very much.